Praise the Lord. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you for everybody that, <laughs> that did it. It really is wonderful to be back, Sandy and I, and we want to thank you for all your prayers while we were in the States. And it's always a blessing to come back home to church family. It, uh, sometimes we don't realize what we really have here in relationship with each other. And uh, that's what a church is. Hallelujah. It's not just services, but it's our relationships. And I thank the Lord. We had an unexpected trip uh, because we went to a memorial service of a dear friend that we've worked with for 20, 30 years. And uh, he passed away, and we went to the memorial service, and it was, it was very special. It was, uh, um, we just saw people we haven't seen for 20 years. People from all over the world came. It was just, it was amazing. We had people from Russia and different places, and uh, it was really good. And uh, we also got to visit other friends and just have fellowship with them that we haven't seen, including my brother. But I haven't seen my physical brother for five years. And it was just really wonderful to see him and his wife. And uh, we saw Elizabeth Ratliff. Uh, some, many of you may know her. She was part of our church for years. She's approaching uh, 80 years old, and she's still going in Zambia. I mean, it's just amazing, and she's she's raising now, thirty raising thirty thousand Bibles, huh? Yeah, to, she's raising money to get thirty thousand Bibles into the prisons. So praise God. Anyway, that's our Elizabeth, and then we went back. We went to see. Uh, a week later, went to see the the widow of his of the of the. Of, of the man that passed away, his name was Connie, and uh, we just ministered to her. And then one Sunday we went to CSC Florida, which is what our church is named after, Christian Service Centers of Florida, and uh, we got to preach there, and they all send their greeting. And uh, it was just very special. We told them Pastor Steve is retiring, and they just couldn't believe it. He said, where did the time go? 35 years ago and uh, so but praise the Lord and they do send their greetings to you uh, this morning uh, the message is entitled aligned with God being aligned with God it's a it's a message that uh, is kind of like a car it's gets in it's aligned the wheels are aligned but often there's problems and you hit these potholes and all of a sudden it gets unaligned. And then other things happen and it can be a problem. When we were in Florida, we also went to a, a really good friend's uh, church, a pastor, and it's a mega church. And uh, we just weren't kind of like Pastor Steve this morning. He did he, no responsibilities. We just went to church. And uh, it's 1,500 people in a big auditorium and everything. And, and of course, it's always, it, it's different. But their theme for the season that they're in was called Aligned with God. But Steve, you would have loved it because... Uh, you know, there's this big stage, and on each side of the stage is a, is a, car, a cardboard copy of a car, uh, bigger than the pulpit here, you know, and just big on each side. And then, and then they had mechanics things and tools around, and then the pastor comes up and preach, and he's in a mechanic's outfit. So I know Pastor Steve loves these kind of things, and you would have loved it, you know. <laughs> And it was, it, was really, it was really good. And uh, he told a story of his car. And this was a true story, but uh, he kind of, I'm sure it was embellished a bit. But, but uh, the thing kept on getting out of alignment. And he couldn't figure out what was wrong. So he would take it to the mechanic, they put it back together again, uh, but then it happened again. And it, 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 he just couldn't figure out what happened. And finally it dawned on him. The problem was that other uh, family members who were driving the car, and he did mention who they were, but I won't say that, 
uh, they were kind of driving recklessly. And they were hitting the potholes and throwing, the way, and throwing it out of alignment. And then because it, out, it was out of alignment, other things began to go wrong. And it, this, all these kinds of things. And it, it, uh, that's how the alignment, we, alignment with a car, you can realign it, but each time it happens, now we're talking about relationship alignment with our friends. Potholes can come in the way. Our relationship with God, potholes can come in the way, and there's problems, and then just normal things that go wrong and problems come. Adam and Eve, they were fully aligned with God. They had their talk talk. They could talk. They walked. They had joy. They had peace. They had everything that God had offered and a relationship that was unbelievable. And then all of a sudden they hit a pothole. We call it the fall of man. And they hit this like a car hits it and they got out of alignment with God and God even came and says where are you and uh, because of the uh, getting out of alignment things began to go worse and then pride and anger became into being and they started the blame game and they said not my fault it's this woman you gave me she says well it's not my fault I mean the devil made me do it and these potholes kept on going and it got worse and worse because they had two sons and one had so much anger and so much pride that he killed his own brother. And that's where these potholes and getting out of the line with God, that's where it always goes and that's where humanity is at the present time unless you're back realigned with God. Hallelujah. The devil's main job in the garden and now and towards you is to get you out of alignment. That's his job. That's what he wants to do because he doesn't want you back with God. He wants you to be separated from God and he does it in two ways. One is through temptation of sin. That's why when the Lord taught us the, his teaching on prayer, he says, forgive us our sins and don't lead us into temptation. Don't allow us to fall into the temptation, into the pothole, and get on aligned with God. The second way is he takes advantage of problems and troubles and disasters and things that just happen. It's not God's fault. It's not their fault, but it just happens. And then all of a sudden, things are happening and you're getting further and further and further away. Sometimes when sickness hits, it's really hard because it's not nobody to blame. You don't go into the blame game, but that happens. And it's a sad thing that we hear of today, of friends, others, pastors, leaders out of alignment. They've been tempted by pride and they fall away from God. The point is, and this is the sad part, it gets better as we go on here. The sad part is we all get out of alignment at times. It happens. And we all hit potholes in our path with the Lord. The question is, and the main thing is, how do you handle it? What do you do? I want to go to my main scripture, and uh, I've asked uh, uh, Jack to, to read it. But I would ask you to look, in, and as he reads, it's the, a very familiar parable called the prodigal son. I looked up the word prodigal in the Bible, and it's not there. <laughs> we just named it that, because the prodigal means reckless, living, abandonment of everything, principles and everything, and just... You're, yeah, you're going for it. And listen of how, what happens. He's aligned, he hits potholes, troubles come, and then he gets realigned. And just listen to the story. 
And he, Jesus, spoke this parable saying, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him and said, Son, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Luke, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost, and now he's found. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jack. I can tell that the Holy Spirit was speaking through as you did that. Amen. Amen. Well, let's look at this parable in context. Because it's quite interesting, because every parable has a context or a reason why Jesus is saying this long story, which was quite long, <clears throat> even just listening and not reading. And uh, so it begins in Luke 15, verse 1. And uh, uh, the prodigal starts a few things later, but it starts out a gathering. It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them a parable. I was thinking to myself, you know, with grumbling at me and everything, my, my tendency would be to tell them off. <laughs> So, don't you understand? I mean, yeah, come on, get, get a grip here, guys. And uh, probably, yeah, I probably would have lost it myself. And because, uh, uh, you know, it says these people, 
these coll tax collectors, these scammers, these sinners. And that's what the Pharisees were thinking. So Jesus told them a parable. He didn't do what my instinct would want to do. But I, 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 I think of, of parables because they're very, very important. And this is a long one, but it's a parable is a short story related to their culture. That's why I like going to the Maasai in Kenya. They're sheep herders, so all the sheep stories, you don't have to explain anything. They, they're right on it. In fact, they tell us stuff on it. And, uh, and, and it, Jesus, with a parable, is if you have a heart to listen and discern and hear the Holy Spirit, you understand it. But otherwise, it'll be just, if your heart is wrong, it'll be just another story. Just a wonderful, nice thing. Also with parables, there's always, a, it's a way of saying something that will be against, maybe against what you're doing, but not actually going after them. <laughs> Hallelujah. So parables are, are pre pretty good. And every parable has a main point, a punchline, a specific point that Jesus is speaking to or is brought forth. They also have symbolism or similes in many of the parables in the same way. And so that's very important. So they're complaining and they're grumbling and their critical judgment. Uh, Jesus spoke actually three parables to them. And they each have their own first. The first parable that he spoke later on is the, called the lost sheep. And it's, it, it's really an important uh, one because the story is about a sheep that got lost. The shepherd goes out to him, finds him, and so on. And then the punchline is this in verse 7 of the lost sheep. He said, just so I tell you, there may be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance or think they don't need repentance because they do. And then he would end his parables often, if you have the ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying. This parable of the lost sheep is about the shepherd's heart. His heart to go and seek after and to save the lost. And that's just what Jesus came. He was the good shepherd, came to seek and to save but it's lost. So the Pharisees are hearing this and some maybe are hitting in their heart. Then he told them another parable about a lost coin. And the lost coin came there and this lady had lost her coin, lost her inheritance, all that was very, very important. And then she searched around and she found it. She called a party together and they all rejoiced. And then the, the punchline is verse 10. says, just so I tell you that there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so the first, the first parable of, of the lost sheep is about the shepherd's heart. The second is the value of the lost. Just like the coin and the inheritance, the value of people in our world that are lost. And the shepherd and us should have his heart to go and seek and save. And both of the two parables are about joy. The joy of salvation because they came and repented. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just looking quickly, and I'll have to go quick, hallelujah, on the parable itself. There's a man, verse 11, right from the beginning. There was a younger son. He decided he wanted his inheritance, but in their culture, the older one is the one that's in charge. And so it was kind of unusual, but the father agreed, he gave it. In verse 13, he goes out, uh, the, the younger one takes all that he has, and it says he squandered, in verse 13, his property with reckless living. The new, the new uh, NLT says he wasted all the money in wild living. 
at the very end, the, the actual, the older brother accuses of them of, of using all the money for prostitutes and all these kinds of things. But wild living, you can think of money, you can think of nightlife, you can think of all the things that he did and experienced. He wanted to experience everything. And when you got money, you got friends. He just didn't do this all alone. He had friends, and there's all these friends, but his friends because he's got money, not real friends. Because later on, you find out there was nobody around anymore. All his friends left once the money got lost. He spent, in verse 14, everything, and then just that pothole that he got himself into, then a severe famine arose in that country. And that's something, too, because that's not God's fault. That's not because he hit a pothole. It just happened. And they, he went on. And so then he ended up, he's probably a Jew because that's what he was talking to Jews. But now they definitely that had pigs were not Jews. So he's in some type of Gentile thing. And here he is feeding pigs now, which was a obsession, I mean, an abomination to him. And he longed. In verse 16, it's amazing. It says, no one, where's all my friends? Where's all this? What's all that happened? No one gave him anything. Wow, pretty desperate. But verse 17 is probably the very key that we all got to come to when he came to himself. He started to survey his heart, his place where he was and everything and what everything. And here he's perishing in hunger. And he says, this isn't right because God is God and wow. And then he had this great idea. I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say, say to him, Father, I've sinned. I've done it. I've sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so you see, it was a good idea. He had a change of mind. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind. There's no act, notice there's no action yet. There's just change of mind. That's the beginning. Because repentance, you're going one way, you're hitting all these potholes, and now you turn around and you change your mind and say, hey, I have done, I have sinned. He become humble because you can't repent without being humble. <laughs> and he turned and he says, this is what I'm going to do. I know this will be my father. Maybe he'll receive me to be one of the servants. And so he arose, verse 20, and that's the second step of repentance, rising up, hallelujah. And he came to his father, but the fa when the father saw him a long way off, the amazing grace, hallelujah, the great mercy, his father saw him, felt the compassion, the love, he ran to embrace him, he kissed him, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus, wow. And the son said, he came through, and he said, well, you know, I'm back. He said, no, Father, I have sinned. It's my responsibility. It's not the potholes. It's not all that. He says, I have sinned. But his father, bring, he said, bring quickly the robe. Put it on him. Bring the calf, and then celebrate. And there was great joy because he was lost and he was found. He was dead, but now he's alive, born again. That's what born again is. You're a dead man walking around, but now you're born again. And, he's lit, and, and another one says blind, but now you see. Because he was blind to his potholes, but now he can see. Wow. The story doesn't end there because the older brother, who is in aligned with God, but all of a sudden got out of alignment and hid his own potholes because he had pride and everything. And uh, his, not, now his older, older son was in the field and he came and said, what's, what's happening? What's going on? You know, and, and, and the servant says, there's a party. Your brother has come back. And look in verse 28. He was very angry. And he actually refused to go to the party. And then the father, even the grace and the wonder of it, his father came and entreated him and said, hey, son. But then he answered his father. And he did just what Adam and Eve did. 
And he blamed this. Look, these years I've served you. I'm this. I'm that. I never disobeyed your command. I'm good. It's just like the Pharisees. And that's why this really hit the Pharisees at the time. And he hit the Pharisees. But, but this, and then he says, but this son of yours, not my dear brother. <laughs> this son of yours, verse 30, came. And he's devoured property with prostitutes. Now, probably, there's no indication that that happened, but probably he just kind of wanted to say something very strong and kind of added something to it. Be very careful. We all do it. You killed the fatted calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And this is an incredible verse. All that is mine is yours. Whew. It really is. When you come to Jesus, when you've been born again, when you are fully aligned with God, all that he has is yours. And all that you have is his. And you're one together. And God says it's fitting to celebrate and be glad your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost. And now he's found. And so there was great joy that they continued on. Aligned with God. It's your choice, actually. You're going to hit potholes. They're going to be there. But it's our choice. And your choice will either bring you to, uh, to, to be back to God back in alignment, back in talk talk, back in the joy of your salvation, or it will move you further away eventually to eternal death. And there's one way to be aligned with God and stay aligned with God. And that's one of the greatest gifts of all is repentance. It's the only way for a person to be saved, to be restored, to be back to alignment, and as we walk with the Lord and our Master, our Savior, so on, oh man, He loves you and you can get realigned. He's provided the way to be realigned with God. And to, to turn and to go and receive by faith all that God has to you. Repentance is the key. And I just want to go very quickly through, through these because I want to get into the main point, which I only got about five or six minutes. But Repentance is what's preached. Matthew 3, 1 and 2, in those days, John the Baptist came and says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is in. In Matthew 4, 17, you can just go through them, Jenny. Is he, Jesus came and said, What? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Acts, at Pentecost, they asked, what should we do? It said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 20, Paul comes and he's with the, with the uh, Ephesian elders and saying goodbye to them. And he says, I testify both to Jews and the Greek of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But look at Acts 17, verse 30. This is the, one of the biggest ones. It says that this is God speaking. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere, all humanity, to repent. Because that is the gift of God, to come and be realigned with him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 2 Peter 3, 9 is probably one of the greatest ones as well. The Lord is not slow to fulfill promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that anybody should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Because it's the heart that's bad, and it's the heart that needs to go. When I hit a pothole and disasters begin to happen, what do I do? What is the choice? I'm going to give you some ideas. Number one, what not to do. Okay, you ready? What not to do. Number one, don't blame God. He still loves you, and it's not his fault. Number two, don't feel sorry for yourself. Oh, me, you know, just me. Number three, 
Don't think God doesn't care. I'm telling you, he cares. That's why he sent his beloved son, Jesus, to die for you and provide a way to be aligned with God. Number four, don't think it's an impossible situation because you, you can go so far and hit these potholes and the disasters of this coming and then sickness and all this kind of stuff. That's not the cause, but being in line with God is what's important. And number two, like five, don't turn your back on God. What should you do? Three things. Number one, stop in your tracks. Come to your senses and pray. Number two, get clean before God. Repent and believe. Number three, trust God and move on. There's some great examples of people doing that. One is in Psalm 51, is the Psalm of David, and that he did when uh, Nathan came to him, it says in verse 1, the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. You see, King David was a man after God's own heart, but he had this real problem called lust. And this pothole, and he saw this woman over there, and he said, I want her, and his lust just got a hold of him, and he hit this pothole, and he had a, had a son, and it was full of iniquity, but he comes along and says, says you know, blot out my transgressions, uh, th wash me from your iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. And those are three different things. They are not just all one. Uh, the, the transgressions is rebellion of the heart. The iniquity is the, per, is the perversion of the mind, and the sin is the actual action. And David comes and, and does all that, but then he repents and he's humble before God. The king of Israel, humble before God. In Psalm 51, verse 10, he says, create me a clean heart. Hallelujah. And we got Jesus to do that. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Hallelujah. And that's the biggest thing when you hit a pothole, you lose the joy of your salvation. And so in conclusion this morning, I want to, well, just look at Galatians 5 through 16. And it talks about walking by the Spirit. You can read it, and he goes on, and he talks about, verse 18, being led by the Spirit. And verse 25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. He says, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't be overcome by the potholes. <laughs> Hallelujah. And there he does. But what is this life that God has for us? when we're aligned with him. You'll find that in Galatians 5.22. It says the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit in my life, and it, it being aligned with God, when you're aligned with God, you'll be full of love and experience it. You'll be full of joy and experience it. You'll be full of peace and patience and kindness and goodness. Your life will be incredible. Faithfulness. Well, this is the fruit of walking with God and the Spirit living in you. Gentleness, even self-control through you see the pothole and you're able to drive around it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Against there is no law, there is no penalty for sin because you are aligned with God. And we come now to the conclusion here, what we need to do is run to the cross when we hit a pothole. We need to choose. We all hit potholes. There's things that happen even without the potholes that are tough. But if you're aligned with God, you will always be in peace. You'll always be in love. You'll always be there. But the answer to be realigned is repentance. We had that this morning. We had it last Sunday. And it's something that you need to do regularly, especially when you hit the potholes and run to the cross. Run to the cross. Be quick to repent. 
David wrote a psalm. And if you put on the piano, PC. David wrote a psalm, and this was his heart. He says, search me, try me, see if there's anything that gets in the way of me being aligned with you. Why? Because he loves him and wants to walk with the Lord again. Lord, I just pray that you, this afternoon, this time that we have here as we have come before you, we've taken communion, we're here, Lord, I pray that uh, we can be aligned with you and enjoy the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Just like Adam and Eve, Lord, help us not to blame or put this and that but Father, just come to you just like the prodigal did. Came to his senses and came and said humbly, I have sinned, please forgive me. And then receive and help us, O oh Lord God. We're gonna run to the cross. We're gonna run to the cross where we first saw the light and the burden of my soul rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight it's no longer I, but Christ in me. May God bless you as you align yourself with God and continue to do that faithfully. You will have the greatest life you can imagine. And many will get saved because they will ask, why are you like this? May God bless you very much. <laughs>
Thank you for this morning for being here. It's been a wonderful blessing morning. We have tea and coffee that's available now. Uh, also, if anyone does want prayer, if you'd like to go to the lounge.